Christian should know the Bible for many reasons. But the primary one is that God is the author. author. All Bible students know that uh, God is creator. We find that in Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. We also, as a, a Christian Bible uh, scholar, we find out that God is the Redeemer. It says in Isaiah, the 60th chapter, and the 16th verse, And thou shalt know that I, the Lord, am thy Savior and thy Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. Then we know that God is judge. He has final judgment. A lot of people today, they don't uh, give God his place. They, uh, they uh, uh, really scramble with the thought that they're even being a God. But know that God is the final judge. One day, every person is going to stand before God and be judged according to what they did here on earth, whether or not they accepted the Lord Jesus Christ or they didn't. And, of course, the person accepted Lord Jesus Christ, God gives them eternal life. And those that deny him and turn him away, of course, their, their destiny is hell. But God is judged. The 18th chapter and the 25th verse of, of Genesis says this. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And God is righteous. He always does right. And so he is creator. He is redeemer. And he is judge. But asking ourselves the question, what do we think of him as author of the Bible? Human writers, and you know, I've been through a lot of this with the, my workplace. Human writers uh, write many books on a lot of different uh, subjects that are wor worldly natured. They are things that maybe about the workplace or things about and so on and so forth. And human write, uh, write, writers feel that it's very vital that we read their books for worldly knowledge. But it's much more important that we read God's book, the Bible. This is spiritual food for us. Uh, this is not worldly food. This is spiritual food. Right. About 14 centuries ago, before it was 14 centuries before Christ, God's word, uh, the Bible, had its beginning in the Sinai Desert. And uh, this uh, uh, really a terrible place to be. Uh, it's arid and it's hot and you know dry and so on and so forth. But God spoke to Moses, yeah. who uh, once was a prince in Egypt. And at that time, Moses was about 120 years old. At God's command, uh, Moses began writing the scriptures of the first uh, four or five books, Genesis through Deuteronomy. You'll have to excuse me this morning. I've been taking some allergy medicine that's making me uh, uh, stumble a little bit. But he uh, he wrote uh, the, the scriptures of the first five books, and we're all familiar with those. It tells about the beginning of the earth, and it goes through many uh, uh, different writings of the Old Testament. More than 1,500 years later, a divine a manuscript was completed on a lonely, uh, windswept swept island in the Mediterranean Sea by a former fisherman, and this was John, uh, John the Apostle. From Genesis through Revelation, the final biblical book, there are 66 divinely inspired books. Right. Over the century, centuries, approximately 40 writers representing varied backgrounds and writing styles served as channels for God's word. They were writers. They weren't, you know, a lot of places call them authors. I don't call them authors. They're writers of the scripture. Even our Bibles will give uh, in the title that the author was a certain person. But the author is God, right? not. And so I'm very, I'm very, uh, I guess, careful not to call them authors but call them the writers of the scriptures yet uh, in spite of all these variations and time and talent you know this is over this is over many many years we just talked about there 1500 years and all these different writers and in spite of this variation in time 
the completed work displays a a, a historical, theological, ge geographically, uh, the uh, tropical and uh, biography unit that is in consistency throughout it. You can't find one inconsistent place in the Bible. And there's many people who might argue certain points of the Bible, but they don't understand. They don't uh, really uh, uh, get what God is saying. You know, they, I know in, in the olden times, they referred to people that were sons of people, uh, you know, like uh, Cole was my grandson, but he's my son. His son would be my son. And I, that's the way they, they uh, I guess, uh, interpreted, uh, I guess, father-son relationship. It goes all the way down through. In other words, they are of my lineage. They are my son. So some people will stumble on that. But there's no inconsistency in the word of God. Now, the Bible's practical benefits for us may be, uh, I guess, well summarized in two categories or two headings, knowing and growing. And we're just kind of doing a little uh, get to fly on the ground with uh, this uh, this uh, topic this morning. But later on, we're going to get into some more depth. The Bible proclaims the good news and from one end of it to the other. It proclaims the good news of the gospel that we might come to know God. The only way we can know God is through the Lord Jesus Christ. You go all the way back into Genesis and you find the Lord Jesus Christ being given. And all the way through Revelation. It's all about the gospel. The good news of the gospel. It explains the will of God that we may grow spiritually before him. I was talking to somebody a couple of couple of days ago, talking about uh, uh, the the Word of God in some some areas, and this person seemed to be Calvinistic. Uh, and I said, "That's Calvinism." They kind of, kind of thought that God knew before the creation of the earth who's going to be saved and who wasn't going to be saved. That's Calvinism. I know some of the greater preachers, and I read a lot of their writings. You know, uh, Charles Spurgeon, he was Catholic. But he was a good writer, and he gave the gospel, and so on and so forth. But if it's already been determined, then that's Calvinism. Right. You know, and I know there's some some denominations uh, will say that that uh, there's no need to give, give an invitation because God already knows who's going to be saved and who's going to be lost. But anyway, the scripture reveals our place within God's program and it, it answers crucial uh, questions pertaining to our origin, our purpose, and our destiny. My destiny is the Lord with the Lord Jesus Christ in heaven for eternity. Uh, we uh, sometimes uh, uh, miss the importance of that. Uh, and I, I gave that, uh, I guess, some deeper thought to the person I was talking to last week. But because God has revealed his unchanging truth, and by the way, anything you read that God said, it will stand eternally. You know, and I've said this many times, but I want to say it again this morning. There's a lot of different promises you may get from different people. You may read manuscripts uh, that, are, that are nationally based, such as uh, uh, Constitution and, for, and, and we, we can read that, but they will not stand eternally. But God's word, anything he says, will stand eternity. Right? And we'll give you a verse a little bit later on on that. But God has revealed his unchanging truths. Brother Jim has been teaching on dispensations in the Bible. A very interesting, very informing uh, lessons that he's given on, on dispensation of time. God never changes. His truth will stand eternally. Now, if you misapply the word of God, and this, uh, I guess, uh, interpret it, and I'll say interpret because uh, that's what a lot of people are doing, interpreting it the way they want it to read, uh, then it's, uh, then sometimes it can be confusing. But, but remember, God is an unchanging God. Anything that he says in his word, it will stand the eternal test. And uh, 
the Christian faith, our faith in God, provides real answers and guidance for every generation. When I say that, I'm, I'm talking about when we ask God uh, in prayer, and He answers that prayer. We we realize uh, that God is a very gracious God, a very very merciful God, and especially in salvation. Also, as we gain our our saved position or our Christian position with God, I'm so thankful that He's long suffering to forgive me when I fail Him. Now, although that we can't grasp with our human mind how individual events fit into God's program, you know, a lot of questions in my family. Why, why did this happen? Why did that happen? But we may not understand. And sometimes it's very hard for us to even try to understand. But Ecclesiastes 11, chapter 5, 4 says this. As I knoweth not what is the way of the spirit, nor how the bones do grow in the womb of her that is with child, even so thou knowest not the works of God who maketh all. So we, we can't understand it a lot of times. Our mind is not, and God reveals as we get to, to get get to be older Christians. He reveals things to us that we, he didn't reveal uh, 20 years ago. I'm very thankful for that. I see things in God's word. And, and of course, uh, uh, teachers and preachers bring it to my attention in a lot of cases. And I understand it. Oh, well, yeah. I, I know I've used this a lot of times. One of the first messages or first few messages, brother, brother Jimmy brought out what, how important the word the is. And now when I read the in the Bible, that is a particular the. When it says the Lord, yeah. that means there's only one. That's it. The and so on and so forth. And so, but we a lot of times we may not understand uh, as much as we should. Now we can understand God's basic plan in order to come to know him and to serve him. I've already said the only way you can know God is through the Lord Jesus Christ. The only way you can come to him is through the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ himself said, I am the way. I am the way. And that is the only way that we can come to know God. Now, going on a little further, few joys can compare with realizing our place in God's program and working to fulfill our destiny as God's children. So, on the word of God, very important to us. This is God's word to us. And it will stand eternally. Anything he promises, anything he says, it will stand eternally. Now, that's not to say, and I will bring this out a little bit later also, that, that, that's not to say that what man says may be, may, is always correct. Man may misinterpret the word of God. Yeah. And a lot of these different translations has done just that. Yeah. And so we have to be careful, but it's important that we read and know God's word. So how did God's word come to us? Number one, the revelation of God's word. Deuteronomy 29, 29 says this, the secret things belong unto the Lord, our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever that we may do all the words of this law. Let me read that again. The secret things belong to God. But when he reveals it to us, it belongs to us and to our lineage. Now, revelation can be defined like this. It's a process by which God imparted to man truths which he, man, would otherwise not know. Let me give you a little bit of example of what I'm talking about. The details of creation. And Moses, of course, was writing Genesis. 
Uh, <clears throat> man came to be on the sixth day of creation. No one, mankind didn't exist before the sixth day. No one would have known what happened in days one through five unless God imparted that to man. Good. So God man, uh, imparted that to Moses that he might write it down as God's word. Of course, we all know that, know that if you know anything about the Bible, you know about Genesis 1 and 2. Uh, it would be impossible for Moses to know what happened on the first five days unless God imparted those truths to it. Now, we know that God spoke to human writers, the writers of our Bible. Hopefully, the Bible that is true to the original, the original writing, and hopefully, uh, and I've, I've done a lot of digging and studying. I, I don't think that, uh, that I found anything wrong with the King James Version, authorized King James Version. Yeah. I've got a lot of different versions, don't misunderstand me, but some of them are a little bit misleading. Now, they'll, they'll say, well, it's easier to read. I don't find any version any easier to read than others. It's not a story. It's God's Word. <laughs> I mean, this is God's Word making plain Communication to you and I. It's not a story. It's not for enjoyment. It's for our our uplifting, our our gain as a child of God. And if you're not a child of God, it is to, to get you to become a child of God. God's word to us, the human here on earth today. And it, it fits all generations, by the way. So I don't find uh, it... Uh, any harder, any easier to read than any of the other versions that I might have read. I've got several different ver versions. Uh, I've got, uh, I acquired the other day, I just seen it, and I thought I'd pick that up, and uh, I will uh, read some of it and see what it's like. And it's, it's it's a military Bible. And it's pretty good. I mean, it's, uh, I'm not really dug into it that much, but it, it uh, gives place to the virgin birth. It gives place, to, you know, it, uh, it, it does a pretty good job, but it's not what I would teach from because the, the true and tried word is the King James Version as far as I'm concerned. Now, God's word came to us through revelation. In other words, man didn't know until God told. Now, there's a lot of questions I might have or that I could bring up about uh, Genesis 1 1 and Genesis 2. Uh, as a matter of fact, I've, sent, I've heard people argue that, hey, look there, there's a disagreement in the first two chapters. But there's no disagreement there at all, no inconsistency. And I feel free to recommending the King James Version to anyone over any other version. But anyway, Revelation, something that was revealed that man didn't know about. And uh, could not have known unless God had expelled it. Now, we know that humans wrote down what God had them to write down. We'll speak more about that a little bit later. But how did he speak to them? Did he speak to them in Hebrew? Or did he speak to them in Greek? You know, that's the two, uh, uh, I guess, uh, writings. Uh, that is either Hebrew or Greek. That the Bible was originally written in. Was it some angelic language? And I dare say he spoke to them in their own language so they could understand. Now, God spoke in a lot of different ways. We'll cover some of that in just a minute. But a good example of that is God, when he called young Samuel, Samuel first, uh, he, and this is given in. First uh, Samuel, third chapter, first ten verses. Samuel first mistook God's voice for that of Eli, the priest, and then he later he became. So he was talking to him in a language that he could understand. He was talking to him in his own language, and so uh, this is a uh, this this 
goes to show you, and you know, God speaks to us in a lot of different ways, and he, and he spoke to me in a lot of different ways. But uh, he speaks to us in our own language. He speaks to us in our language now, as far as I'm concerned, is King James Version. Now, you can, all you can get a lot of different versions and stack them up here. They'll stack up very high. They're probably taller than I. I've got several, you know. I've even read some of the Catholic Bible. And uh, there used to be one downstairs. I don't know what happened to it. But uh, I've, I've read some of it. But nothing compares, as far as I'm concerned, to the King James Version for its, its truth. Now, some, sometimes God has spoke through angels. An example of that is when Gabriel came and, and told the Virgin Mary that she was going to bear the Messiah. We find that in Luke, the first chapter. And on other occasions, he spoke directly to man. I think he spoke directly to Noah. He said, you're going to send a flood. And uh, every living thing on earth is going to drown. He told him exactly what he wanted him to do. And I think God, uh, Noah followed it to great detail. And his family was saved from the flood because. Now, one of the one of God's methods of communication is to reveal his message through dreams and visions. The wise man, going back to the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, the wise man were warned in a dream not to go back to her. You remember when the wise man came to to uh, to see the Lord Jesus Christ? Of course, Herod, he had he had a motive to try to kill the Lord Jesus Christ. That was the devil's work in that in that situation. But God told him in a dream, so don't go back to Herod. Don't go back to Herod. Peter was instructed to minister to Cornelius in Acts the tenth chapter. God has communicated in many different ways. He revealed himself to Moses in a burning bush. And uh, in the Old Testament, we find many, many places where uh, divine truths were given in the, the Old Testament, Old Testament through the angel of the Lord. And most Bible students think that this this heavenly messenger was the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ. And I think they're probably right. For example of this, the Lord reassured, reassured John, uh, Joshua on the eve of battle. And Joshua, the fifth chapter and the thirteenth. So God speaks in a lot of different ways, but mainly he speaks to us in our own language. Today, I don't look for a vision. I look for looking at God's word and praying and asking yeah. him to give me, to give me uh, understanding. I don't look for a dream or a vision or anything because God has written it all down. I've got it right in front of me. I don't have to. And I know there's a lot of different movements today that would uh, lead you to believe that there's more than the, the word of God. That something else has been given a little later on and so on and so forth. Many religions, and I'll say religion, have based their whole beliefs on something other than the word of God. And most of us uh, can give example of, of this. Uh, there's no there's no other word but the word of God. It's complete from Genesis to Revelation. Yeah. And that's God speaking to me. Now, God's word is inspired. I know I was reading where somebody was talking about that. Uh, they were talking about it was inspired. It's inspired God's word. Isaiah, the 59th chapter and the 21st verse says this. As for me, this is my covenant with them, saith the Lord. My spirit that is upon thee and my words, which I have put in thy mouth, shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed seed, 
saith the Lord, from henceforth and forever. What's God's will? That we stay centered in his word and we follow and obey his word. That is his, that's his intent for us. I know today, oh, there's so many, so many things that compete for our time. There's TV. There's not a lot on. I was talking to a friend of mine. I'll, I'll give this little, this is kind of funny. So what kind of TV do you buy? And I told him. He said, uh, he said, I said, I give too much for it. I said, they're way down now. And so on and so forth. And I'm not advocating you even should have a TV, by the way. Uh, and, but anyway, uh, he was talking about it. He said, well, do you like it? I said, well, yeah, it seems to be a pretty good thing. Well, where did you get it? I said, I told him I got it at a certain store. I said, I've seen them at other stores a little cheaper, you know. And he said, uh, he said, uh, no, I'm going to get the one you've got. Now, what was the number on that? So after Christmas, he was getting that for his wife for Christmas, I think. And after the Christmas, I asked him, I said, did you get that? Oh, yeah. I said, do you like it? He said, no. I said, there ain't nothing good on it either. <laughs> and that's about the way of TV. There's very little good on TV. Most of it is bad. But it competes with our time. We're not careful. We'll be allured to waste our time watching some silliness on TV. Yeah. <laughs> watching something like, uh, uh, what's that old the story? Of, uh, I can't even think of the name of it. The, the farmer that him and his wife came from New York. What's the name of that show? Uh, that's a huh? No, it's not the hillbilly. That's silly too. It's so silly, you know, and you waste your time even watching it, so on and so forth. But a lot of things compete for our time. But our time should be spent in trying to understand God's intent for us. And we do that through studying his word. And here in this verse, it says, stay centered. Stay centered. Don't let it depart out of your mouth. Now, the word inspiration is found only once in the New Testament. Second Timothy, the third chapter in the 16th verse. I'll, I'll just kind of get my plow on the ground this morning. We'll. We'll continue the next time I, I teach. But at uh, 2 Timothy, the third chapter and the 16th verse says this. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Now, that's the only place that you find inspiration mentioned in the New Testament. But there's a lot of other verses that might come from a different direction to tell you the very same thing. Uh, God, I just read one, uh, even in the Old Testament, in, in the 59th chapter of, uh, of Isaiah. Same thing. But we can only find that. Now, <clears throat> divine inspiration logically follows, uh, is followed by revelation. It's our divine uh, inspiration is, is following the divine relation. God's giving man something they didn't know, but he write it down. It's God's word. In Revelation, God speaks to man's ear, while by inspiration, he guides the pen that ensures the imparted message that he's given is correctly written down. So when I think about reading the word of God, I'm talking about the original. Some uh, translator may have changed it. But I'm talking about the, the original. I'm assured from God's word that he proofread it. This is exactly what I want you to say. This is exactly what I want you to write down. Now, I, I've done a lot of, uh, over the years, I, I know one day I was involved in writing some things for a company and sent it off to the printer. And uh, I'd have to proofread it real old. And over and over and make sure everything's just right. Over and over and over. That, it's a, I never did like to do it. But no matter how many times you proofread it, there was some, might have been something wrong in it that had to be corrected. You know, like the printer would come back to it, did you really mean to say A instead of and? And so on and so forth. So I, when I think about God, it's inspiring the word of God. God breathed. God made sure what was written was exactly what he said. No mistake. There are several ideas about the process of uh, inspiration. 
One's called the natural theory. This says that the Bible writers were inspired in about the same way that William Shakespeare was inspired. Another theory called the content theory suggests that God, God merely gave an idea to the writer or to what he wanted the content to be and the writer chose in his own words what he would write down. But in, you know, this is some people's belief. You know, I, I said Paul's, Paul's uh, writing or that's just Peter's writing, or that's just Moses' writing, or that's just David's writing. No, it's God's writing. Right. In contrast, what Jesus said himself is this. He said that the very letters of the words were chosen by God. Notice what it says in Matthew, the fifth chapter, and 18th verse. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall not shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Ever comma, ever quotation mark, everything. And so Jesus said this, till heaven and earth pass, not one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law. Now this position is referred to as a, a preliminary uh, verbal view uh, which says that all the very words of the Bible are inspired by God. The very words. Right? Every period. Every comma. You know periods and commas are very important. You know, Brother, Brother Jamie from time to time will men mention some of the uh, punctuation in the sentence. And, hey, this is connected to this because of this punctuation. Or this, and so on and so forth. So it's important. But God put every, every punctuation point and everything. It's, it's, it's true. It's his, it's his word. Now, Jesus once told the devil that the Christian or the child of God is to live by every inspired word. Notice what it says in Matthew, the fourth chapter and the fourth verse. But he answered and said, is, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. <laughs> now, this don't sound like somebody that's been given an idea and they just write down what they want to. I mean, one day we're going to stand before God. All men are going to stand before God. And we're going to be judged according to his word. And, uh, whether or not we're saved or lost from his word. Man's going to be judged according to what God said. Now, does this sound like something that some man that's got an idea and he just said, I need to write down some things? No. The Bible writers understood that their, their writings were being guided by God, by the Spirit of God. Even as he wrote them, and Peter said this was true of the Old Testament writers. And he said this in 2 Peter, the first chapter, 20th and 21st verse. It says this, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. In other words, don't pay no attention to my interpretation. You know, make sure you check it out. You know, I've, I've listened to a lot of good teachers, and a lot of good preachers, you know. But I, I always check them out. If it's something that I don't know about the Word of God, I check them out. I think we should. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but by holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Don't sound to me like uh, an idea that I would expound, expound on and place it in the Bible. This is God very pointingly, pointingly uh, giving his word. 